Glad to be back on the Nation Leadership Forum and warm and hearty welcome to this conversation. As always, this is a platform that creates an interface between the public, private, and other stakeholders in this economy to deliberate on issues of national importance and see how we can advance the agenda of driving this economy forward. The Salaries and Remuneration Commission has published the draft allowances and benefits policy and guidelines for the public sector. The Commission hopes that the policy can, and the guidelines can help Kenyans rationalize the bloated allowances and benefits in the public sector and trim the wage bill, which stood at 87 billion shillings in the financial year 2019 2020. Tonight, we want to explore how the draft policy seeks to rationalize allowances and benefits in the public sector. And to do this, we are now joined by Lynn Mengich, the chairperson of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission, Rose Mora, the chairperson of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya, Kwame Wino, the CEO at IEA Kenya, and finally, Dr. Abraham Morio, the country manager at the International Budget Partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on set. Let me start with Rose Mora before I come to Lynn Mengich. Um, for a long time, there's been a general consensus across stakeholders, including ISPAC, that one of the challenges that we've had in this country about rationalizing our wage bill is the fact that there wasn't a coherent policy framework. When you read the draft policy, do you feel we're beginning to address this challenge? Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me on. Absolutely. Um, uh, I think uh, we needed to address this challenge. Um, but uh, definitely there are several issues we must think about. Um, as you've said, yes, the wage bill has been uh, ballooning um, over the years, but we also must look at the fact that um, our government has really expanded over the, of the, over the many years, from let's say 2013, um, you know, growing into the various um, organizations. We have the county governments coming in. We have all the, the commissions that, uh, you know, the independent commissions coming in and so forth. And then, of course, we have other things like duplication of uh, functions across the board. So, for example, if you look at the agricultural and health sector, we're finding that there's duplication from a national government and a county government. So when you're looking at all this, um, of course, this will contribute to a wage bill. And in a situation where we're taking half of what we collect every year, which is the 1.6 trillion we collect from KRA, and you know, taking it to just uh, salaries, and that becomes an issue. Um, however, I think um, part of the concern here is that um, we, we must look at really um, what is the value of each of the jobs. And I know that this bill is um, attempting to do that, this policy framework is attempting to do that. What is the value of the job that everybody um, you know, carries out um, and what is the worth of that job? And then, because what has been happening is that at some point the government attempted to try and take everybody the same salary at each other at a given level. So whether you're a driver or whether you are a professional, at, you, you know, the government attempted to pay everybody at that same level. And this is what has brought it to effect all these uh, allowances that people are being paid. So if it's a pilot, you need a, you know, an extra allowance for a pilot, a coxswain, an extra allowance. If it's a lawyer, they want extra allowance. You know, if it's an accountant, they want extra allowances. But if we can actually look at the worth of every single job, and then so we, we might be in a position to, to reduce some of these allowances. Madam Rose, let me Thank hold you. you to that point. Thank you so much for that introductory comment. And cross over to Madam Lynn Mengich. We have been having this conversation with you from as far back, I think, as 2019, uh, from the Wage Bill Conference to conversations last year. And now here we are. Just give us an introduction, an introductory view, I should say, in terms of how much of a milestone you feel the Commission has actually realized with this draft policy. No, thank you. Let, let, let me, uh, in answering that, let me pick some of the points that Rose has mentioned. Indeed, as you mentioned, the wage bill is at 827 billion, which is really slightly over 50% of ordinary revenue. But if we look at the growth in the wage bill, what is important to note is that the growth in itself has not been, has actually been showing a very, very positive trend. If we look at the trend from 2012, 2013, it was growing at about 20%. Uh, by around 2017, 2018, it had actually come down to about 10 percent. 2018, 2019, the growth is 8 percent, and 2019 to 2020, it's only 4 percent. So if you look at the actual growth in the wage bill, it is showing a very, very positive trend. And that growth in itself it speaks to what Rose has already alluded to, which is about the, the coverage of services in the country. 
So it's important to understand the wage bill in itself is not something that we can shy away from or say we cannot increase the wage bill. It is delivering a service to this country and it is showing a very positive trend in terms of absolute growth, uh, in terms of percentage growth on, uh, every year. However, the problem that has been stated is when we look at the wage bill as a percentage of ordinary revenue, then yes, we are spending about 50% of the ordinary revenue in wage bill. What is the contribution of allowances in that wage bill? The allowances stand at 322 billion of, the, of, of, of that figure. It's currently about 40% of the wage bill. And that is the reason why it is important to look at allowances, because if you are talking about 40%, then it's not something that you can ignore. So what do we hope to achieve from this policy? Now, the policy itself is looking at strategic areas that in the long term will begin to slow down the growth in the wage bill. Now, I have seen some, uh, in some places people talk about this wage bill is about cutting allowances. It's absolutely not about cutting allowances. It's putting in place very key strategic policies that will ensure that you slow down the growth in the wage bill. So will it address that problem? Yes, absolutely. We feel very strongly that it will achieve three main areas in terms of the wage bill. One is achieving equity in the wage bill. And that is uh, a, a requirement in the Constitution that in pay determination we must take into account equity. So that's one of the things it will address. The other issue that it will address is one of fairness and transparency. Again, it is a pay determination principle that is stated in the Constitution. And the third one, it will now help in addressing the issue of fiscal sustainability of the wage bill going forward. So those are the three broad areas that we are confident that this policy, when implemented, will progressively address those three key areas. Thank you so much, Lane, and we'll be coming back to you for more detail on this draft policy. Let me cross over to Dr. Abraham and uh, just latching on to what Lena said right now, that uh, if you look at the overall trajectory, indeed there have been efforts to try and uh, trim the wage bill in this country. But the challenge, on the other hand, is that reven the revenue base is not growing as fast enough. What's your assessment of the general lay of the land as far as the fiscal sustainability of our wage bill as a country is concerned? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate this conversation because it's important. Uh, it's important uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, we must look at wage bill as a factor of that, uh, as a factor of what are we spending the money on these wages for. A big part is that the public is supposed to be a driver of economic development. Now, uh, there are two things that are worrying uh, in that discussion. One is that when you look at the growth of our, our wealth as a country, the gross domestic product, uh, we, in the last five years, uh, we have more than doubled from a five trillion economy to about 10 trillion economy. But the revenue uh, growth is still stagnated at about 1.5 trillion. In other words, uh, whereas the economy seems to be growing big, the amount of money the economy is generating uh, is not commensurate. And for me, that's where the problem is, that then the wages, which are very important in my opinion, don't seem to be commensurate with the revenue growth, because then revenue growth is the, is, is the indicator that we basically are producing something that we can be able to utilize. Uh, and that's where the sustainability question. But let me add two other factors. You need to look at the wage discussion, uh, including allowances and benefits. Uh, also in the light of pensions, uh, which are obligatory uh, kind of uh, expenses, but also in the light of other recurrent expenses like public debt uh, and, uh, and, and spending, uh, for instance, at the county level for, 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 for services. And, and, and therefore, you realize that whereas, yes, um, and I agree with uh, Lynn, that yes, our growth in wages has fairly or more or less uh, uh, you know, uh, been balanced, these other factors are also squeezing money out. So as we discuss the, the whole issue around how much we are paying our public servants uh, uh, to spend, then we need also to be bringing in these other factors. What else are we spending in that is eating this money? And secondly, why are we not having the production that we need? Secondly, 
I think it is important for us to ask, when we are spending the kind of money we are spending on wages, who is actually benefiting? Is there equity in terms of uh, the resources? When people are in the same office, uh, when, for instance, a boss is going for a trip, a government trip, and they have to go with their secretary and their driver, the kind of allowances they get for the same destination of where they are going is their equity. And therefore, I think that's an important discussion because reading through the report, you hear the language that we are very in, unequal in terms of how these allowances and wages. So, so I think the question of equity, but also the question of what else are we supposed to be balancing with, which is as critical in determining how much wage and is this wage enabling us to produce what is sufficient uh, to be able to meet it. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Tari. I'm told by my news director that we need to be taking a break. But before we take that break, Kwame, very quickly, one thing you said, which I think is very important, the growth in wages is not commensurate to the growth in revenues. And I think that boils down to the subject of productivity. And if you remember, one of the resolutions from the Wage Bill Conference was that we need to develop a productivity index. Kwame, when you look at this, do you feel we are calibrating this in a manner that we should in terms of productivity versus compensation? Uh, well, I, I think that if you ask me anything about what the work of the SRC has been. I think this is work that's come a bit late, but nevertheless, it's fantastic in my view, all factors considered. And one of the ways is because at the productivity, I mean, as the, at the wage conference that you mentioned, uh, it's really stunning that many Kenyans think that people in the public sector are poorly paid because when they discuss, when unions discuss wages, they simply discuss the, the, what is registered as your level pay. But the allowances that people are able to take tells you that sometimes when we are discussing wage dis differences, I mean wage uh, differences in Kenya, we are completely discussing two different things. So the SRC must get credit for bringing this discussion together and say, look, um, let's talk about what the uh, actual wages are. So there are people who actually claim that Kenya's wages, I mean, uh, wages are not high because what people take home at the end of the month, which is subject to taxation, is much, much less than what those other alliances are. So that's the first. The second is I think part, part, part of the reason public productivity matters in Kenya suffers is because the wage system has been designed in such a way that it gives perverse incentives to state officers to actually use meetings as a way of augmenting their, their wages. And so I think, I, I will not put words in your mouth, but I think Lini is telling them, look, it's okay if we pay you one single wage, but to the extent that it's possible, if you have too many variables about um, how a wage is determined, the question of equity comes in, and it's even perverse, and I actually think it even generates some corruption. So. Those are some of the ways in which I think this report will bring us to a very important discussion that must be had about what exactly is a wage. And if people are paid poorly, instead of compensating them through alliances, just pack the wage all together and use that as a basis for paying them. Because you're paying them anyway, it's just that the other one is, is covert. Right, and that point by Kwame takes us to a short break. Remember, you can be part of this conversation online by tweeting at NTV Kenya at Mboko JH. The hashtag is NMG Leadership Forum. Let's get to know what you think about this subject. We'll be right back in a short while. Back to this edition of the Nation Leadership Forum, where we are discussing the draft allowances and benefits policy, which was published by the Salary and Remuneration Commission in an effort to rationalize allowances in the public sector. And quickly back to the conversation, let me start with Rose Moura uh, of the ISPAC. A while back, ISPAC issued a, a, a policy document, rather a, a position statement, I should say, regarding the wage bill in Kenya. And one of your arguments was, it is not necessarily the amount of compensation, it's about the sheer size of the public sector. And uh, if I could cite the numbers which are being given, there is about 680,000 public servants. Do you feel that despite the progress you're making in terms of the draft policy, then that will remain a challenge? So, uh, thank you for that question. I, I think we go back to the issue of uh, productivity um, per person and um, what is the worth of the job that these people are doing. So while we might have um, the public sector um, at uh, you know, a large number, and I, I'm not sure what the statistics are currently in terms of the public um, servants that we have, I think when we started off, I, I did talk about um, making sure that there is really no duplication um, of efforts and the fact that um, because of our, our new constitution and the national dispensation, we've had a lot of duplication of services. So it would be important, yes, to relook at that to make sure that we really uh, remove all duplication of efforts in terms of the different um, roles and so forth. Um, but but I also think um, really the, the the key issue we're talking about what what is um, what what does somebody when you each 
each role, when you get into the office at 8 and you leave at 5 o'clock or whatever time you leave, what exactly are you doing in that particular role? What is needed in that role from a skill and experience, a number of years of training, the environment in which you, you're working in, um, all those things need to be considered um, at the end of the day in this job evaluation. Because you're saying the main problem we have today is that um, we have retained that very low basic salary and trying to give everybody the same basic salary. And then we have cobbled on top of that all these allowances. And a lot of these allowances have been quite discriminatory, not fair. So you find, for example, if you're working in the police service, um, the police might get, uh, let's say, a police allowance because they're deemed to be the core, um, that's a core function, but accountants and anybody else working within that will not get any allowances. The same thing happening in the health uh, sector, same happening in the legal sector. You find that if you go to the state council office, the state council, they'll get um, all this, what you call other additional extraneous allowances, including um, non-practicing allowances, but yet uh, the same accountants who are working there supporting, let's say, the office of the DPP, supporting the attorney general, will not get some of these allowances. So I think a lot of this is really, we must look at one, we, we need to rationalize in terms of um, the person, so if you're talking about the number of staff, what exactly are they doing and how many do we need? So that is important. But secondly, we must also look at redefine what is the worth of every job and we look at the basic salary. So there's no need of having a basic salary that is worth, let's say, 40,000 shillings, and yet you then have another allowances worth about 100,000 shillings or whatever that number is. We've seen from this report that those allowances are from 40% to over 100% because we keep on adding these allowances because somebody has uh, other, some other special things that they're supposed to be doing or have some extra responsibilities. Okay. Well, as part of the job evaluation, it's very important that the SRC must relook at what is the worth of every job, what is required of that job in terms of experience and all these things, and then come up with an appropriate uh, basic salary. Let's not lie to each other that um, every single job can have, at a certain level, can have the same salary. This is what has led us to where we are. And let us all be fair as well. Let us not have some people um, being more special than others and uh, being given certain allowances and yet others. And I'm spe talking specifically about people like accountants who are denied quite a number of allowances, um, you know, because they're not considered core and for some of these uh, areas, and yet others, let's say doctors, um, legal officers, and so forth, continue to get. So let's, okay. we need to be really fair across the board. And, I, and it's very good that I had uh, Lynn um, talking about uh, fairness and equity and all that, because then it's important that we, we do all these things. Let me hold you there, uh, Rose Moura, regarding that issue. And cross over to Lynn. Lynn, I'm sure you'll want to respond to a couple of issues raised there, but one of the elephant in the room uh, subjects regarding this draft policy is the proposal to cap the ratio of um, allowances to gross sal salary, I should say, at a ceiling of 40%. And the big question here is, how did we arrive at 40%? Right. To answer that question, let me, let me pick some of the issues that Rose has raised because it's actually around the same discussion. So from what Ross mentioned, and it is, um, it's in the document that we've published, you'll find that today when we talk about the pay of a public servant, most likely they will talk about the basic salary. But they will not mention the allowances, which account for uh, you know, more than 100% of the basic salary in some cases. What that does is to distort the pay. And as Ross rightly said, it means that for certain professionals, because your pay is largely basic salary, someone doing the same job who has probably another three, four, five, six allowances, although you are at the same grade, your take home is not equitable. So one of the things that uh, we will achieve from this policy document is really to entrench the relative worth of jobs as they should be. And starting from this third remuneration cycle, as we carry out the, uh, the current job evaluation, we will be looking at pay from a gross pay perspective, not from basic pay. So by looking at gross pay, then we will then be able to compare the total gross pay of roles at the same grade 
and try and understand why that disparity, and we know allowances is one of those that is causing these disparities. That really is the genesis of the 60-40. Now, where, how did we arrive at 60? Or, or, uh, or, or we could have picked another figure. Now, this was actually informed by looking at other countries generally. Where is the average? And the average is around 70, actually. Even some countries, neighboring countries, are around that 70% of your gross pay is basic salary. But given where we are today, where on average you're looking at 48%, then we then took a view to start with around 60%. Because even for that, it is ambitious even for our setup, given where we are coming from. So really that is what is informing the 60%. Ideally, it should be around 70 if we were to use the global benchmark of where we should be. Now, why is this very important? Uh, the importance of this is one of the things that Rose mentioned is about the relative worth of your job. And you can only do that by ensuring that we don't have a lot of allowances that inherently introduces disparities in pay even of jobs that are uh, of the same worth. So that is the genesis of, of that 60-40. It will help us to address the huge disparities that we have. And if we went to the 60, it will progressively achieve that parity, that relative worth of job that Rose has consistently said. But let me confirm that we do carry out job evaluation. We have the relative worth of jobs, but the allowances has been distorting that um, pay structure. And that is where we are coming from. But, but let me also very quickly touch on the productivity, which, which Rose has mentioned. She has also mentioned the optimum staffing levels. And I just want to confirm that, yes, allowances alone is not going to address the issues that we have around wage bill. Productivity is so key and core to the entire conversation of, of uh, the wage bill. Productivity will help us to address some of the issues around the revenue growth. There is definitely a relationship between revenue growth, and productivity in the public service. So separately, we are addressing that, and it's not the, top, the subject of today, but it is an issue that the Commission is looking at to see how we can introduce a productivity and performance-related pay to try and push the productivity agenda in the public service. Crossing over to Kwame, thank you so much, Lynn, for those comments. Uh, what's the IEA assessment of the proposed 40% ceiling on allowances to gross pay? Um, well, I mean, we had the same question. Obviously, this is based on, as, as, as Lynn has mentioned, that um, um, there's some, I mean, a global review sh suggests that it's a, somewhere between, I mean, it's at 70%, which would be. Uh, but to interpret this, what it means is that if you earn 100 shillings as your basic pay, it is still possible to earn a, take home 140, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the, of the month, in addition to your, to your basic pay, uh, which means it is possible to actually say your basic pay is 100, but basically you take 140. Um, um, now, the narrower that gap is, the better for sustainability of the wage bill, but more importantly, the more predictable it is for the purposes mm. of planning. Because the, the, what worries us as the IEA is, we don't think necessarily, though we think that some, 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 some specific professions within the public sector have very strong unions and they've been able to actually claim for themselves much higher than they do, and they often do that by getting it through the allowance systems. Uh, partly because the allowance systems also comes fairly, it can be done fairly regularly, uh, but also not all allowances are subject to taxes. I think Lynn should confirm that for us as well. But the perverse incentive that comes from earning most of your income from, from an allowance is very clear to a taxpayer. What that means is you generate more trips, you generate more, uh, most of the work does not take place within offices so that people whose work is to write reports and do specific deliberations prefer to have them in Naivasha or in Mobasa just so that those allowances can be claimed. Now, this proposal um, is useful because actually it will cap them at that 40% place, so, um, which is sensible. And I think my view is that uh, um, that's a sensible one. Um, I also know, as Lynn has mentioned, is that because they're existing, they're existing um, undertakings that the government has made through collective bargaining, bargaining agreements, obviously those are contracts that will not be voided, but 
when the next ones come, I think what the CRA, uh, SRC will have to do very, very keenly is to ensure that government itself uh, and, and officers negotiating adhere to this. And if that happens, obviously we'll have a smarter, but also a public wage bill that actually reflects the reality, as opposed to one that reflects the ability to cheat the system by having many more meetings in order to, 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 to get income. So if we want to pay public sector workers well, we should do that, but we shouldn't lie to ourselves that we are paying 100 when actually someone is earning 300, 300 shillings for, for the same thing. Right, and crossing over to Dr. Abraham, before we took the break, one of the issues you mentioned is that um, a key part of the wage bill conversation is actually about the pension liabilities on the exchequer, which is a very valid point. But don't you think to the credit of government, I mean, effective January 1st, the superannuation scheme has kicked in and effectively there are migrating uh, civil servants from the defined benefit now to a contributory scheme? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Julian, for that. One of the things that uh, we know very well is that uh, pension is a great obligation, a heavy obligation. Uh, again, in just about the last five years, and the history is well known because of when we did the structure adjustment programs in the retrenchment in the 8th, a big population of the civil servants have retired or are retiring now. Uh, and the and the weight the weight on the uh, on the exchequer is, is is fairly heavy. We've moved from about 54 billion uh, just six years ago to about uh, 132 billion this year. And uh, listening to the Treasury CS, uh, there's even been delays in processing um, uh, uh, those, those those amounts. And anybody who has talked to a pensioner knows that it's taking almost about two to three years. Uh, to be able uh, to, pro to process and to be able to access uh, your pension, your pension fund. So I think moving to a contributory scheme uh, is key. Uh, and perhaps the way to move to a, a, a contributory scheme that is functional would be, uh, for instance, to say that a good way to address the whole issue around allowances, because as I listen uh, uh, to colleagues, including my own parents who are former civil servants, is that allowances seem to try to bridge a gap for poor basic salaries. Um, isn't it time to actually undertake a process of improving the kind of salaries? Now, remember that uh, we are talking about uh, a workforce that is critical for the country, but that only accounts for just about 4% of the total uh, uh, formal workforce uh, in, the, in, the, in the country, uh, if you think about it, and spending the amounts of money that we are spending. Could that actually be a way to translate this uh, uh, to, 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 to better basic salaries uh, as, as way of, uh, as we know them today, and therefore play down on, uh, 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 on, 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 the, on the, the kind of allowances and benefits. And they have their place, and I completely agree, I think they have their place. And therefore, civil servants then get to contribute and they have an incentive. Uh, but a second uh, a piece that I must bring in addition to that is the whole question of performance and succession management. Uh, which also has got a lot of bearing in the discussion we have today. Now, performance management was established as a way to be able to ensure that we are able to reward our civil servants for work done. And, and basically, if we, are, we are obtaining value value for money. All organizations do that in private sector, in nonprofits, in the NGO world, we do that. Um, and, and it's critical that then, therefore, there is an incentive. Uh, 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 first of all, that if I perform well, I am able to grow in the scale, I'm able to uh, uh, basically earn better. There's an argument of about attracting and retaining great talent within the civil service. Again, that will be addressed in a process where basically performance is rewarded, is celebrated. Uh, but what you see with a lot of the allowances, and I think uh, Kwame uh, did, 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 did allude to that, they become um, an end in themselves. In other words, I go to participate in an activity so that I earn an allowance. But what is uh, 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 the, the basic value uh, of that? But before I, I, I pass over, I think there the, 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 the needs a discussion on the rationale of the allowances before even we say we need them at 60%. What are we trying to incentivize within uh, uh, public service? What are we trying to incentivize in terms of our productivity? What is it that we are trying to achieve? Is 60% the right, uh, the, right, the, right, the right capping? It could as well be uh, that it's actually that 70%. But that 70% compared to what? The other countries also have huge, some of them have bigger GDPs than ours, others have, 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 have less. So I, I think it's important for that conversation, including the pension one, to be tied to a performance regime that re 
towards those who are working uh, and also that assures uh, a continuity uh, in the future uh, of, of the government. And that also then will be tied to the revenues because then when people know they have to produce for them to be able uh, to be paid, then that already is, is an incentive and particularly uh, when it is transparently done and rewarded openly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Dr. Ari, I just mentioned that the public uh, sector pensions liability stands at 132 billion. I should clarify that if you read the supplementary budget, this was revised downwards to about 120, so just to be clear on that. Let me cross over to Rose Moura, and uh, clearly there's a con contention here about the basic pay is not well com compensating. And if you speak to many people, and the feedback I'm seeing online is that salaries in Kenya, particularly in the public sector, are not graduated to reflect changes in the macroeconomic environment in things such as inflation. What's your assessment of this, Rose? Um, I think that's what, well, that's what we're all saying here. We're saying that um, that basic salary, and I think I like what uh, Abraham has just said, that that basic salary has been kept at such a, a low, um, uh, I guess, amount and then to compensate for that low salary, uh, of course, uh, without maybe the, the necessary, you know, changes uh, based on the changes in macroeconomic factors, then that low basic salary um, has then now been uh, augmented, uh, you know, here and there um, by all these other allowances. So you find that somebody is getting, you know, some, I, you know, various types of allowances. Um, mainly for, uh, you know, doing their job. So maybe if it's a policeman, they're getting uh, policing um, allowance. If it's, um, uh, maybe it's a lawyer or if it's a doctor, they're getting a medical allowance. So the question we're saying today and what we think is the right thing to do, let's have a proper job evaluation that takes into account all these things. What kind of job do you do? What kind of experience? Um, do you need what number of how many number of years do you need of training? What kind of environment? What kind of hazards? What kind of risks? What talent retention do we need? Somebody was telling me today, for example, if we think about the coxswains who drive the ferries, I think all of them have most of them have been poached to go somewhere else, isn't it? Uh, because uh, you know we're not looking at that talent retention. So let us look at all that and then offer a proper. Um, basic salary so that we stop this whole thing of, you know, giving all these different allowances uh, because of somebody's roles and responsibilities. Then let us all, of course, you know that there are certain things that we must give allowances. Maybe we must give allowances for housing, maybe for facilitating people to travel and to do all that. But then also let us be fair. Let us not be discriminatory in terms of these allowances. Some cadres of uh, staff get certain other salary, I mean, other allowances, and yet others do not. So really bringing in the issue of fairness um, around this will become very, very important. Um, and we, and of course, we know that it's going to have an impact on, let's say, for example, like pension, because perhaps one of the reasons why the salary, basic salary has been kept so low is so that when you, when you calculate that, uh, um, you know, pension as a percent of basic salary, then it's on a low base. And of course, if you increase that basic salary to be at least 70% of your total um, allowance, then you might, and then you find that even some of our retired civil servants, some of them are living on, uh, you know, penury in, you know, because of uh, their, their um, pension is so little because it's been calculated on whatever they were earning. Yes. And yet when they were working, they were getting this huge number, this salary because it had another, you know, a larger amount. In fact, I've been getting messages from my members at the institute are asking, what are these allowances these people are talking about? But that's also because of the discriminatory nature of the allowances. Some people get those allowances, other professionals don't. Let me hold you at that, uh, Rose, and I must really come to Lean at this point. A question which has been asked, Lean, uh, is about how do we rationalize? How do we explain the allowances, even before we talk about streamlining them? And to answer that, I would just like you to latch onto this. The draft policy proposes five allowances, house allowance, commuter allowance, job-related allowance, task-related allowance, and labor market adjustment allowance. Maybe if you could walk us through the rationale behind those five, it would be a better place to really understand why we need to streamline them. Right, let me start by saying that currently the allowances we have, based on a study of 2019 carried out by the commission, we've got about 247 allowances. Now, if you are 
trying to look at 247, the first thing is, are they really unique allowances, 247? And the answer is no. These 247, uh, some of them is a question of different nomenclature, but they are given different titles and different rates. So you will find an allowance, for example, uh, in what we have said in the policy will be restructured or renamed. So there is a set of allowances that will just be renamed because it's just a nomenclature issue. But there are also those that are restructured. You're paying the same allowance for, you're, you're paying different allowances for the same thing. Now that's where we're talking about restructuring those allowances. So when you look at the sheer number of 247, what this policy then um, opts to do is to cluster them to those five areas. That the purpose of that clustering is so that we can now begin to actually manage those allowances with an aim of finally trying to see how to collapse them into smaller uh, number of allowances. But we have purposely looked at five. The first, the, first, the first one, house allowance, is because the Employment Act does state that uh, an employer should provide a house allowance. Although the, the Act also acknowledges that you can consolidate into uh, consolidated pay. So that's why it remains a standalone. Commuter is also a very specific allowance that cuts across the entire public service. So you'll find that those two cut across. Now from there, all the others are unique to different institutions. So we therefore cluster to three other main broad areas based on why they are being paid. So when we looked at the 247, we then came up with actually three additional to the two of housing and commuter. And this speak to task-related. And task-related allowances are specifically allowances paid for a short-term project, a task that has a beginning to an end, it's addition to your job. A classical one is, for example, the task force allowance. So those are task-related, and they are quite a number. Then we have those that are job-related. Now, job-related, uh, and Rose mentioned quite a number of these. These are allowances that is actually to do with your job. If I pay you a prosecutorial allowance or a medical allowance or a police service allowance, and that is your job, mm. this allowance that, that ideally should be part and parcel of your job and should be part of the relative worth of the job as assessed through a job evaluation. So any allowance that is in that category are actually potential for collapsing to be part of your basic pay. And there are very many of those. Then we then come up now with the last category, which is the market adjustment allowance. Again, Rose alluded to some sectors where you compete, with talent inter you compete for talent internationally. Marine is one example, and she gave some examples of jobs that, uh, that, that fall in that category. So we want to recognize some unique, critical, scarce skills. They are rare, they are critical, and that, therefore, will continue having that allowance as a market adjustment. So what all this does is basically try and, and compress the allowances to those categories and then help us to try and address those that need to be collapsed as part of basic pay, those that will continue being paid separately, and over time, we should then reduce that 247 to a very small number. Wow, that point by Lynn Mengich took me back to my labor economics classes in undergraduate. I think we shall take a short break. <laughs> we'll be back with a lot more on this conversation on the public sector allowances and draft, I should say, allowances and benefits policy. Don't touch the dial. Welcome to the tail end of this conversation where we are unpacking the draft allowances and benefits policy. And I'll request my panelists, let's keep our comments brief so that we have enough conversation going around in this tail end. Let me start with you, Kwame. A lot of sentiment online goes back to what I just asked before. The view is that um, the basic salary in the public sector is not graduated to reflect changes such as inflation. The average inflation in Kenya is about 5 6%. If you look at how it's, the basic salary is increasing annually, do you feel it covers this? Um, no. Uh, well, I mean, okay, that claim, I think, is um, first, it doesn't work for everybody. Um, but there are, there, are, there are cadres in the public service who have an automatic rider every year to receive uh, a certain adjustment every year. So obviously the claim that you, that it doesn't, there's no adjustment that is automatic is not true. 
So that's the first. And the second is, uh, there's no principle that says that every salary must be adjusted for, 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 for inflation if you're not measuring productivity. So it will not be clear whether you're paying a fair wage if you're not measuring Kwame's wage against the productivity. And for as long as there's reluctance even within the public sector itself for productivity to be measured, it's difficult to convince a um, taxpayer uh, that your wage is far lower than it should be, um, especially if you consider um, um, uh, inflation and stuff and, and, and things like that. Because obviously, if government revenue, which is what is used to pay public sector workers, is falling as a share of GDP, and yet you have a growing public sector, then it's telling you that there's something about a productivity within the public sector itself, or something is, is amiss. So against that background, we can't then just leap and say that, look, if I am paid 10%, I mean, um, if inflation was 9% this year, then you need to compensate me for 9% so that I'm at the same level as I was last year, yeah. before I negotiate again for what the union may find for me as a, as a part. So definitely some of those are part of the, um, the way in which some people within the public sector uh, speak from both sides of their mouths. Um, because a wage cannot be paid as an ad in itself. A wage is paid vis-a-vis -vis what does this wage contribute to public sector performance. Right, let me cross over to Lynn, Lynn Mengich, and uh, there are so many skeptics online and um, some of the issues they are raising, let me just point them out. In June 2015, I remember, the SRC launched the public sector remuneration and benefits policy. How starkly different is it from what you're proposing now? And also, we, we had the com conversation earlier about the capacity assessment rationalization program, uh, about optimization of structures in the public sector. What impact have this had, and now how do they build the case forward for the draft policy? The policy that has been referred to is, was a general policy about remuneration and benefits policy in the public sector. That policy was not specifically addressing allowances. So to that extent, it's a different strategy to, to really look at allowances as a specific area. Although this policy will obviously be part of the overall policy on uh, remuneration and benefits in the public sector. So, so that, that, that's the first uh, difference in that. Now, coming to the discussion on caps and rationalization of um, staff, this was a discussion at the wage bill conference. Because when you look at wage bill, there is the issue about the actual numbers. So as long as you increase the numbers, then the wage bill will go up. Then there is obviously the question of how much are you actually paying. If you increase the wage bill and it is growing faster, than your ability to generate revenue, then obviously it becomes a problem. So indeed, the question about optimal staffing numbers was raised at the wage bill conference. There is a specific resolution around that, and it is uh, being taken through the process as agreed during the summit that it becomes one of the issues that should be addressed in the public service. Have we made progress? Not yet, but it is definitely one of the resolutions that will be addressed due, uh, through the steering committee that was set up. But I just want to touch on two other things that have been mentioned for clarity. The first one is the, that actually the public sector wages are, in most cases based on a, a study that was done, higher than private sector or equal. It is only in certain cadres where it is slightly below. So I just want to, to, uh, to, to really emphasize that it is not true that the public sector wage is lower than the private sector. The survey that we did in 2014 was very clear that actually the public sector is well remunerated uh, except a few er cadres. So, so that, that, that's one thing that I just want to correct. Uh, the other one, Kwame, which you had asked earlier on is, are allowances taxed? Let me confirm that they are taxed so that we, you know, we don't get the impression that they are actually not taxed. Okay. They, they, they are fully taxed, yes. Thanks, Lynn. And let me cross over to Rose. Rose, there's a question here online, and this gentleman is asking, ISPAC is consulted annually by the National Treasury in terms of views going into the budget. How are they asking the questions they are raising as far as compensation is concerned? Um, so... Well, I'm, I'm not sure whether specifically to do, is this to do with specifically with the salaries in terms of the budget? Yes, we are consulted, um, and yes, uh, we provide our input um, into the whole budgeting process, and uh, uh, we give our thoughts 
um, on both the expenditure side and also on the revenue side. Remember, the budget is made up of both expenditure and revenues. Um, so, of course, we have seen over the years the fact that um, expenditure is actually growing um, significantly. We've had that this expenditure of about $3 trillion a year for the last few years. And yet we know, as we said, our ordinary revenue has remained at about uh, $1.6 trillion. So we're doing other things to meet the shortfalls, including borrowing uh, and so forth. Um, so this whole issue of um, uh, way, the wage bill is, is very, very um, important that it's looked at. Um, of course, uh, I have to say that um, the National Treasury does not always listen to, I mean, they're listening to many voices and sometimes they don't always act on what um, ISPAC uh, recommends, but it's important that we look at this. However, my bigger concern is that, um, and this is uh, to Lynn and her team at um, SRC, if you look at this rationalization of allowances and benefits on its own without looking at um, the wage, the rationalizing the jobs, um, uh, the, the wages, the productivity, and also the worth of those, uh, the job itself, and coming up with the appropriate basic pay, I have to tell you that um, this is not going to be successful because you're not going to tell somebody who has been receiving a significant part of, uh, let's say, their salary in terms of through allowances, and then you tell them, I'm going to take away these allowances. You will end up as the normal issues in Kenya, people will go on strike, and before you know it, we will not be successful. So this needs to be a really, a very holistic way of looking at things in terms of fairness, in terms of looking at the worst of, I mean, we've talked about all these things. So that when you're saying that you're capping it at 60 or 70 in terms of the basic salary, then this has already been well thought out and you, you, um, you've really done an assessment of that. I think that's very, very important or else it will not be successful. Thank you so much, Rose. And uh, Dr. Abram, if you can hear me, one of the concerns online is the fact that uh, we are in an environment, understandably so, where fiscal consolidation has really been thrown out of the window. And uh, the view is that do we have any optimism that the draft policy being floated by SRC will actually be implemented in the sort of environment we are in right now? Uh, thanks. I mean, um, the, I think the challenge that we have had, um, and rightly so, seems to have been uh, the race to the top. Uh, which means that uh, for all the allowances that are created, there seems to be a desire to achieve the highest maximum number of uh, allowances. And that's why SRC found, for instance, uh, you have people drawing as much allowances as 100%, more than 100% of their salary. Of course, there, it can be debated whether uh, then, as I said earlier, the best option would be uh, to review the salaries of those individuals uh, <coughs> and those cadres. But there's also the equity, the equity question. But I think we have a bigger challenge uh, of uh, following with the commitments that we have made. We are in a, currently we are in a fiscally constrained uh, environment, and any coin that can be saved uh, and rationalized uh, needs to be pursued. Now, uh, whereas we all appreciate uh, 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 that there is need, I think even the public service can lead from the front. Uh, by demonstrating a commitment uh, to be able to rationalize, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 pay, particularly around this, uh, uh, this this particular difficult time, is happening. You know, our revenues are not performing because the economy is what it is, uh, and, and 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 I think there is there, there is value in that. But what we have seen in the last uh, couple of years is that even when our revenues have not performed, we seem to have expenditure. So expenditure seems to be the only thing that is growing uh, and growing fast uh, in, that, in that sense. Uh, as Rose noted, uh, in the last two years, uh, we have uh, raised concerns, uh, South East Park uh, Institute of Economic Affairs, where uh, my colleague Kwame works. We've raised concerns that uh, whereas revenues fail to perform uh, instead of reducing expenditure, we are increasing the deficit. What that does is that it increases how much we have to borrow. 
when you increase how much we have to borrow, it, 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 it increases how much we have to pay back. This year alone, this financial year alone, we are paying close to a trillion and collecting about 1.5 trillion. In other words, if you, with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a wage bill of about 827, of course, this year will be higher, say 860 or there about billion, and you have only 500 billion left, then you're running a deficit even on salaries. Yeah. And that's where the sustainability problem is. So, 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 so the rationalizing, yes, is in the right direction. But I, as I said, we need to have a bigger conversation uh, on, on exactly how much should we be paying against other, 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 other resources. But I, but I find it without any fiscal consolidation measures, without any commitment uh, to live within our means, I think it, will, it might get to a point where we are not even able to pay the very public service, uh, mm -hmm. public servants that we really care about uh, and are concerned that they are paid properly for the work they do. Thanks, Dr. Let me throw a question to Kwame, and the same question will go to Lynn very, very quickly. Uh, just what he has been speaking about, the goodwill, the commitment. The PFM Act is very clear that not more than 35% of revenues should be going to personnel emoluments. Clearly, we have been flouting that ever since we got that act in place. What measure of confidence do you have, starting with you, Kwame, that even with such a policy, then we'll be able now to essentially toe the line? Um, okay, I think the one is just bad news, which is that uh, whatever happens, I think in the next three years, um, government is going to have to come back and uh, address this question. Parliament, the executive, it's going to happen. So we're going to get to a point where we say what is it that can be paid for and what cannot be paid for and what are the priorities. Uh, I'd rather it did not come to a crash landing which then forces all these adjustments to be made because as you can say today, it doesn't matter if you have alliances or a salary. Um, public reports are that there are people who actually are six weeks behind in terms of their wages. They haven't been paid wages. And I suspect some of that might be an affordability question. Um, so that's the worst that could happen. The best, basically, is just for uh, the SRC to start a diplomatic thing with Parliament, which actually could do a good job in terms of taming everybody's wages. Um, and it's not just about wages. Basically, asking everybody to adhere to sensible policies such as what is proposed in here. Uh, so again, it has to be the institutions that are required to perform their roles for parliament as an oversight institution and the guardian of the public pass to do that. So th those are the only options. Either it will be a crash or we make the best of, 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 this, of this situation because what we have right now is definitely unsustainable. Lynn, the same question. On the 35%, you are right that the PFM Act is very clear. However, since 2012, all the way uh, it's always been around 50, 52, 53. The best we had was 2018, 2019, when it was 48%, but it's now back to the 51%. So really, it's, it's sending a message that unless we do something as a country on the wage bill, it may crash, like, like Owino said. It, is, it, it can happen. We just don't have the fiscal space to continue accommodating a bigger wage bill if we are not growing revenue at the same level. Uh, and, but I, let, let me add that there are counties who have actually achieved the 35%. There are very few, but they are there, which means it is doable. What we do need is commitment at the top, leadership commitment to say, yes, we need to move that direction. We need to address the issue about the optimal numbers. We need to address productivity so that you can then generate more revenue uh, in order to address this thing. So as I close, really, it, the revenue, is, this wage bill will always be a factor of two things. One is what SRC can manage through some of the initiatives like the allowances that we are, we are, we are initiating. And yes, it will make a contribution. But in itself, it is not going to take us out of where we are today and get to the 35%. Because there are other factors. The other bigger one is to do with the numbers, the optimal staffing numbers, and then of course revenue. Unless revenue is grows faster than the wage bill growth, then we will not achieve this. So yes, we are doing our part, and it will contribute to it. It is important that we get the commitment from everybody to realize that we cannot continue um, on this path we must do something about the wage bill. And as Kwame said, yes, there are, there, are, there, are, there are counties who have actually failed to pay salaries. Why? It's about fiscal affordability, sustainability and affordability of the wage bill. Mm -hmm. So let's address it now. Let's hold the, com the commitment to realize that 
things are not as usual. We've got fiscal constraints, and we must all address this issue of the wage bill. We've got about six minutes to go, and let me just start with the closing thoughts. Uh, Rose uh, from ISPAC, your closing thoughts on this subject, please. Um, I think it, I, a part of it has been said, eh? from a national leadership, uh, we must uh, lead from the top, uh, you know, sort of take the leadership, because um, it becomes a challenge, and I, I mean, I'm hearing all the concerns that we're saying, but it becomes a challenge when, let's say, from the very top of our leadership, we don't then take some of those sacrifices, and then to expect, uh, um, you know, other other persons within the whole, uh, you know, public service to take some of those sacrifices in terms of um, of uh, this rationalization. So I think it's very, very important when you look at the overall uh, wage bill that um, there must be some, uh, you know, clear leadership really from, from the very top of the public service in terms of what uh, can be done. Again, the issue of rationalization of the jobs, of um, measuring the job worth and the issues of productivity are very, very important. They must be taken into account, or otherwise we will not be successful. Again, of course, if we do not do that and just focus on the allowances alone without looking at um, the entire, you know, the, the, the job worth and what the, that basic salary should be, then we're really looking at failing. And the issue of fairness, and equity across the public uh, service okay. must be taken into account or else again we're looking at this then becoming almost uh, a non-starter so i think those things are so important um keeping that all those into consideration um, yeah thank you i think that's what um, i would say um, as my passion short thank you very much dr abraham very briefly uh, thank you. I want to agree with colleagues uh, that really, indeed, uh, this is uh, this is a critical position. I want to say uh, 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 three things. That one, once we fix the discussion around productivity and what role uh, the public service uh, is expected to play, particularly in our current constitution, percentages of how much we spend on wage bill think become uh, something of the of the study because the counties that are definitely bigger uh, and that five percent may be a constraint to them achieving greater. Secondly, I think uh, this conversation cannot be uh, 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 locked just uh, within, uh, 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 you know, the process of what we are discussing. It needs to be uh, engaged in public participation in a public forum, just like even agendas like BBI. What is it that we expect from our public service and therefore how much resource should we devote uh, to advancing uh, 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 their capacity and their value and, re and, 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 and basically being able to remunerate uh, them properly. And finally, I think it is critical uh, for us uh, uh, to, to, to hold ourselves as leaders uh, to implement some of these things. There has been discussions, for instance, rationalization of parastatals. Uh, the report, the bill has never moved in parliament and we don't know where it is. Uh, uh, there, there, there are still many other, I mean, expenses, like I've just said, around public debt that need to be discussed so that we see this as a total, total package. I think we should wa be working now on how we all survive together, on how we all get to enjoy the better of this country and not sinking things uh, uh, further. So, so for me, I think uh, that will be critical. And of course, working to ensure that there is equity for everybody uh, 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 from the least paid public servant to the highest uh, in position. Uh, to ensure because they all are mandated with the same responsibility to serve the people of the Republic of Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. You have mentioned BBI. There was actually a question online, but I knew if I opened that, then it will just be another conversation which needs about an hour. Kwame, your closing thoughts, and maybe now you can answer that question very briefly, Kwame. Someone is asking, you guys are talking about rationalizing allowances. Have you read the BBI report? And he leaves it at that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, I think that, uh, to, I mean, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly about BBI, and everybody seems to think that passing or not passing the BBI, to be honest, BBI would be a, a fly on the wall regarding this, uh, um, the, the public sector wages, especially if it is not, because whatever happens, um, um, I, I think the, unless there's some discipline in the way the wages are structured, I mean, we, we are on a train wreck. We are, on a, we, we are facing a train wreck. But that aside, two things. Uh, Public sector wages should be based to the extent that is possible in a transparent uh, mechanism. And that's what I think these alliances and benefits policy. So if you have 247 different alliances that could be claimed depending on your area of work, obviously 
uh, that's a very, very messy form of, of, of structuring wages. So this is supportable for the reason that it's a very sensible way to approach it. Now, whether you like everything around it is a different matter altogether, but a conversation around, around how wages are, are determined and the transparency of wages where the basic wage net does not necessarily represent everything else leaves very, very big room for, for fiddling here and there. So that's the first. The second is we have to come to a point where there is no debate about what the public sector wage which the size of the public sector is, both in terms of numbers and who's being paid and how much they're being paid. Um, if this gets us along that way, um, then we are actually probably in a much better place um, than we would be because it is not clear, in my view, that in the next three years the wages will match, the, the growth in wages will match uh, revenue sources, partly because of COVID and also other frictions within the economy. So we'd rather take this sooner than later because otherwise a hard day of reckoning would be the worst form of, um, would be the worst option we'd have to face. So I'd rather we just take this and continue to do that. Because the wages policy, as it's growing now, based on the numbers that have been declared, uh, is a risk to public sector solvency. Thank you so much, Kwame. Uh, Lynn Magic, uh, close it up for us, and uh, please, as you close, just tell us what are the next steps as far as this draft policy is concerned. As I close, let, let, let me emphasize that one is that the, this allowances policy will only help us to some extent but it is not the only initiative that the Commission is undertaking to address the wage bill. Indeed, if you are to look at the wage bill resolutions, and they are available on our website, you will quickly notice that there are many other initiatives. And I'm glad the issue about productivity has been mentioned by all the panelists today. Yes, we have a very specific resolution to address productivity. And specifically for the Commission, it is to recognize performance and productivity in reward and that is what the commission is committed to do that on top of just paying salaries based on color we will be introducing performance related pay so 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 there are many other initiatives now what do we hope to get out of this which uh, draft policy the first one is the issue about equity that has been mentioned repeatedly so through the job evaluation that we undertake and is even ongoing as we speak, we do assess the relative worth of jobs. And this policy will help us to look at, as I mentioned earlier, when we talk about the worth of a job in terms of money, it is a gross salary, not just the best salary. So that is the first thing that we will be addressing. The other one that, that we will achieve is a question of disparities, which is created by the number of allowances. So it's equity and fairness, it is transparency, and it's also addressing the issue about the wage bill. So as I close, what do we expect next? This document is out there for public participation. So we will add, any of you who has not looked at it, it is on our website, get to our website and you will be able to actively participate as a taxpayer. Secondly, we will put together all that feedback and now issue a final policy before the end of the financial year Thereafter, all public institutions will have a maximum of six months to fully implement the policy. Thank you very much, Lynn McGee, for your closing thoughts. That takes us to the close of this edition of Nation Leadership Forum. Stay tuned for more programming.